Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I want to welcome you to Covenant Calendar. This study came about because of an, a question that I was asked. It was on Ecclesiastes 1.5. How come the sun is in a hurry? That's the question. And I thought about it myself, and I says, I don't know. Let's have a look. So this study is the result of a question from Maria in Greece. The title, Shamar the Shemesh Suri. Shamar, that is, to guard. It's to listen and act accordingly. But when you put the R on the end, it also is to guard. What do we do when we guard? Preserve. What are we preserving? The Shemesh is the sun. And a scurry, if you've ever watched a chipmunk run around amongst the rocks, they dart in and out, across, over, top, and in between, and all over again. They are in a scurry. They're doing it quickly. There's a need, a persistence behind their movements. So what is the persistence behind the movement of the sun? A scurry, Ecclesiastes 1.5. Solomon declared this verse. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hurries to the place where it rises. Ecclesiastes 1.5. This study is all about the last five words of that verse. The place where it rises. That's what this study is about. The Shemesh was in a scurry. It was in a hurry. There was a pressing need, necessity to get back to the place where it rises. We're going to look at the King James Version here. The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to the place where he arose. Hasteth. There is a necessity. We're going to be looking at that necessity. And look out for this lion. Yeah, see that paw hanging there? It's ready to swat you. <laughs> That's what I get out of this picture. Have you ever questioned why it is the sun is in a hurry? And if so, are you listening? Are you listening? Shema. Are you listening to the word of your creator? Shamar the Shemesh Skuri is the topic here. Have you ever marked your straight shadow yet? You look on the left, you will see a straight line shadow. A straight line. This only happens in one day. And over here, I want, well, first let's notice on the bottom, this is dated on the 20th. It was a straight line. But let's come over to this picture in the middle. Note the date. It's on the 19th. The third month. In this year, third month in Gregorian terms, look at this straight line right here. Very, very straight. No shadow of turning. That's the verse in Yaakov or James 1.17. It identifies a shadow and it identifies a straight line shadow. So you'll see the marks here. There's the marker, the vertical marker. It has a shadow. It comes over here, and it's marked out, the end of that shadow, as it progresses through the day, it's marked out in a straight line. This only happens two times in the year. There's the vernal equinox and the fall equinox. We call them the time of teshuva, the turning, the turning point. So as we begin... Please note here, this study will be at an intermediate level for many, and I ask you to glean as much as you can. It'll be worth it. I went to a computer class once, and I'm very challenged with the computer, and I was lost, and the instructor spent time with me, and the instructor finally said, just get what you can today, because the rest you can get later. So this is what I'm asking you today. Glean what you can today. Tomorrow, there will be more. 
So let's start at the beginning, creation cycle number four, Genesis 1, verse 14. Let lights come to be, and let them be for sign. Note the emphasis on sign. Will this command reveal the reason Abraham sacrificed a calf and was recorded as sitting down? This last question is part two of this study. This is the whole context of this study. What was it that Abraham was doing? And why was he sitting among the trees? Why was he in the door of his tent? Was he just sipping a cool iced tea, as we would understand, in the, in the shade of his tent? Or is there a lot more to, that, to those verses in Scripture than just sitting in the door of his tent? We got to go through some context first. Could a shadow be a light sign? A shadow is a degree of light. So, what is the kingpin catalyst sign established by Yahuwah? And could it be important to Mark? A broad hint is found on the next slide. How to pronounce this, these Hebrew letters? A mart. And I want you to notice the tov at the end. This is a tov. You'll see the mark out here. Excuse me. Why is it that this word is found only three times with a tov at the end? Why is it only found with the tov in Genesis 1, 14, 15, and 16? Is there an event connection? Remember that a tov can be a sign a seal, a mark, a signature, and a covenant. This is from the Hebrew lexicon by John Parkhurst. It's from 1762, so you might see a little bit different Old English in here. And it's the grammar section. And it's in the comment on the great lights. You'll see the great lights written right here. These are the Hebrew words, Imart Egdolem. And he is identifying it comes from Genesis 1, verse 16, right in the area that we're going to be searching. And going down to the blue underline here, and perhaps in such expressions as imart egodolim, the adjective with a termination usually masculine is joined with a feminine substantive as a mark of dignity or excellency. Tov. Could that be a covenant of excellency? I want you to note this tov. It signifies a signature of some type. What about this eternal covenant? We need to look into this. Genesis 1.14, And Elohim said, Let lights come to be in the expanse of the Shemayim. If we go up to the Hebrew letters here, you'll notice that in the word imart, the aleph and the resh, that is the root of or, or is the word for light. The light, imart, was not created here in Genesis 1.14. There was no need to create nor recreate that which was already created on cycle number one. Note Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. That's where the heavens and the earth were created. So what is this where it says, let lights come to be? Could this then be an assignment of duty? Might it be an eternal mandate application? Considering this as a great commissioning, what identities were assigned a duty? And also, what was and what is that duty today? Again, and Elohim said, let lights come to be. I want you to note the blue underlined letters. They are the Aleph, the Resh, and the Tav. Aleph, a Resh, and the Tav. The Hebrew letters, starting at the Aleph, please notice 
this picture of the ox. We're going to be running into this ox later on. Only this is a good ox. It's not a mean ox. It's the ancient Hebrew portrayal of the Aleph letter. This is the modern portrayal of the Hebrew. What is the Aleph? The Aleph is the pillar of strength. That's one of the definitions in the kingdom, the kingdom of Yahuwah. We come down to the Resh. It's a head, picture of a head. This is the modern Hebrew Resh. The head is the center of authority, to put it mildly. And this is just a very, very basic definition. There's many, many more. But the main one in context that we're looking at today is the center of authority. Could it be forming a covenant, a mark, a sign, a seal, and a signature? This is the picture of a tov. According to the ancient Hebrew, no, it's not a cross. Please don't mistake it for a cross, though it might look like a cross. When you go to vote and you put a mark in a box, this is basically what it is. It's a mark. It's a sign, a seal, and a signature. It is a covenant. When you put your mark in a box to vote, you are covenanted to that individual vote that you are marking your name to. It's a signature. So what might this signature seed encapsulate? Might it be eternity? These lights coming to be, it is a covenant. So before going further, we need to search carefully for the meaning of a mem. And on the right, you'll see this, uh, what would appear as a squiggly line. How about the waves of an ocean? Kind of looks something like that. This is a mem letter in the modern Hebrew. The base meaning of this letter cannot be overstated at this point. So I hope you'll bear with me through here because we're going to be going through some details. We're going to be looking at a Hebrew lexicon from W.H. Barker. This is from 1776. And yes, you will see some different English. This is old English here. So bear with me. If you look at the end of this pink arrow, there's a mem letter. It's a 13th letter. And we're coming down to the underlines here. Seems to have been taken from the rolling of the sea and resembles the undulation thereof. Undulations directly equates to frequencies. Now we saw that picture earlier. That looked like the waves of the ocean. That's why it looks like that. It signifies the frequencies such as the waves in an ocean. Mayim here, the mem yod, closed mem, mayim, signifies water. Mayim chayim, water of life. Water. Coming down to this one, this underline here. Water being the mother of all productions. That's an interesting statement. As a servile mem and prefixed, come over to here, mana or mana. Notice the mem right here at the very front, at the first of the word, because Hebrew reads right to left. Mana. So what was the frequency of the mana? Did it come every morning, ready for dawn? That's what the frequency of this one was. And what did it do? To distribute. It distributed what? Life. They did not go unhealthy with the manna. They were in good health. It distributed life. It had a frequency every morning. Coming down to this underline, it forms nouns, this mem letter, signifying the instrument. The means, and note this one, place of action. Mem, pretty interesting word, or letter, I should say. The mem indicates a limitless distribution property containing frequencies. Yeah, you're going to see that word frequencies fairly often. 
Genesis 1.14 speaks into Yahuwah establishing his covenant system, a frequency signature for life encapsulated within what? Light. This is not just physical light, as what we probably thought in the earlier years of studying scripture. This is also, and most importantly, a spiritual light also. So what of these frequencies? How about that mem letter at the very beginning of Moed? Why do we have a mem? Or sorry, why do we have an M at Moed? Because there's a mem letter there. There's a frequency. When do we see Moed frequencies? Is there a possibility of the mem frequency being built within the Kodesh convocations? Ones that return each and every year in exact Shane timing? Shane, it's exact. It's not on a crazy system that doesn't reproduce identical. It is exact. So what about the Mem letter in the Equinox Teshuva application? What about Tikufot? This is the plural of Tikufa. One Tikufa, plural I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but we'll give it a try. The frequencies. When does the seventh day Shabbat frequent this earth? How about Passover, unleavened bread, wave sheaf, Pentecost, trumpets, tabernacles, and jubilees? Are these Kodesh identities, are they returning in a cyclical fashion? Is there a frequency to their timing? Is there a certain frequency to these Moedim, the feasts, returning Shane after Shane? That's year after year. And what about Tekufa? The Tekufa, and the, <laughs> I love that uh, one that chapter that Walter read this morning. It's all about the Tekufa circuit. Chapter 19 of Psalms is so good. The Tekufa circuit event is a regular occurrence. The Tekufa is the assigned pathway of the sun, and it traces out with extreme precision. Let me say that one more time. With extreme precision, each shane, or every year. The word for a year in Hebrew is shane. The sun maintains its existence by traveling specifically through the constellations of the Matsuroth, within the heavenly realm. It's a repeated cycle, a duplication. It replicates itself. It is a seed within a seed according to its kind. So might it then be declared that the Tekufa has a Shane frequency once a year? It's a light. It is a light frequency, a mort, if you will, in Hebrew. The mem, an undulation frequency. Mem, pretty important letter, very important. And what about the word teshuva? You've probably heard me say that a few times. The teshuva is a turning. It's an action word. A turning, like turning 180 degrees. It's a turning. And when this verb is applied to the celestial bodies, it clarifies the events of the equinoxes. Mark the emphasis, not equal lux, as some people would have you believe. The equal lux is a totally different, very different identity and concept altogether. A teshuva, a turning, when we apply this to time, it references two specific appointments within the shane when a straight line shadow sign can be observed on the ground. And you can read about that shadow in James 1, verse 17. Incidentally, it was this very shadow that Hezekiah requested of Yahuwah to return back 10 degrees on the sundial. There was many things that Hezekiah could have asked, but he asked for the shadow to move. He didn't ask for a change in the year. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for health. 
he asked that the shadow on the sundial be moved. Note the authority in this shadow. This 10 degree reversal, in turn, altered the length of the year. Please don't ask me how Yahuwah did that. I have no idea. I can't explain it. I have some ideas, but I sure can't explain it. But Yahuwah used that request at 700 BC to alter the number of days in the year. Prior to that sundial incident, it was 360 days in a year. And after the sundial incident, when the documentation of the nations brought forth their yearly documentation, it was 365 days. We will be returning back to that 360-day year. That's a guarantee through prophecy. But that's for another topic. Or another day, I should say. Let's go back to this teshuva. There's two teshuva turning points per shane, and they reveal a most specific frequency. What of these frequencies? The Takufa circuit event is a regular occurrence. The Takufa circuit repeats and has a shane a, or a yearly frequency. With this in mind, are we able to find a mem or a frequency letter in application to this event? What about teshuva? Let's look more into this teshuva. Consider this verse that directly references the circuit of the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.5 The sun also ariseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth back to the place where he arose. This defines a shane year, one governed by the shadow. There are other types of years that people want to suggest cannot accomplish this place of origin, returning back to the place of origin. Their circuits obliterate this paradigm that Yahuwah imposed, and their circuits go beyond that point where it arose, or they are before it. Yahuwah does not allow other other calendars, if you will, or other circuits to repeat this circuit as in point of origin to point of origin. The other ones are counterfeit. That's the importance of this verse. It defines Yahuwah's circuit, his 360 degree circuit. Has the Takufa a frequency? The sun also ariseth. The Hebrew word for ariseth is zarach. One of the meanings is to break forth in distribution of rays. And the sun goeth down. Here we read H935, full. The traditional meaning is for the sun to go down. What if the sun never goes down? as such. What if the sun simply oh, goes or enters into another locale beyond our vision, out of our immediate sight, allowing the darkness to overtake the light? Darkness overtaking the light. Don't we read about that in Genesis 1-5 with the word Erev? Some of you will notice that I'm being very careful with my words in this context here. I'm going to continue on. Has Takufa a frequency commission? What is that commission? And hasteth. There's a reason for it. There's a purpose. H7602. The purpose is to get back to the place where it arose. There's those words, the place where it arose. We read in Psalms 19.4, I could say that Walter read in Psalms 19.4, that the sun was assigned an ahel, a tabernacle, a special place of dwelling. Very appropriate chapter we read for devotion earlier. Does the sun ever vacate? It's assigned to Kufa. 
Does it ever refuse its commission? Sorry, Yahuwah, I'm not going to go on my mission today. I'm just going to sit still. No, that sun is in its Takufa circuit each and every day without fail. What does Yahuwah ever make that fails? Nothing. What about the sunset changing the day? How come it failed 36 times written in scripture, and yet people still think that the sunset changes the day? What would happen if the sun decided it was going to fail its assignment? I'm not going to do the Takufa circuit this year. What would happen to this earth? The sun never fails its Takufa circuit. So what is the commission? Why does the sun purposely hasten back to the place where it arose? Shall we look at location? Now it's going to get interesting. Location, 4725. The place of him. This is in that verse. The place of him. Note the double mem letters. Frequencies. Place of origin for frequency distribution. Do we need a definition refresher? Well, could look at slide 11 one more time. A frequency of the sun. In terms of timing, the sun has two basic frequencies. Number one, there's a 24-hour frequency where it restarts every dawn. Dawn is morning and is H1242 Boker. H1242 is derived from H1239. So if we look over here, this is the word Boker, Beit Huf Resh, Boker. How come that I've taught that it has anything to do with an ox pulling a plow? What does Boker, what does Don have to do with an ox pulling a plow? Keep that in your head for a minute. We're going to be looking at this a little bit later. Boker. If you look at the etymology, I'll get that word out of my mouth, etymology, <laughs> we'll see here it's the same letters, and it's got a different number, H1239. So let's look at the root word of this word for dawn. The word is bakar, a couple different letters. they got an A here and an A here instead of the O and the E. What's different about this word? It's the same Hebrew letters, but it has different meanings. What connects this to a restart at dawn? Just to mention here, this word bakar, this is the word used to describe the laver in the tabernacle that Solomon built. That laver, the sea of water, if you will, that laver rested on 12 bakar. What is that translated to us as? Feet of oxen. There's that oxen again. 12 of them, not 13. So this, this directly relates to the ox pulling the plow at dawn. This is where this word comes from, This the root etymology. So I asked you, what does a what does dawn have to do with an ox? Well, when we go looking into the into the root words, let's have a look here. 1239. This is from Jesenius. The primitive root. An ox and a plow. Here's the letters. To cleave open. Sorry, I should sorry, I I said that wrong. To cleave. To open. What does opening do? What does cleaving do? Isn't that splitting, dividing, separating, to cleave apart? When we come down to here, plowing. Plowing. Isn't that separating, dividing, and distinguishing? And what does this? What does the plowing? Well, if we look over here, it's an ox. An ox and a plow at dawn. To break forth. And a rising of light. Break forth. Does that sound like the eyelashes of dawn? When it's really, really dark out and that first light comes above the dark horizon, 
you see the light searching out? Is it inquiring of the land? What is here? It's inquiring. It's investigating the land. It's searching out light. It's putting forth light. This is what's behind this word, boker. To look after, to take care of. The light is taking care of the land. The light of the sun has a premier task at dawn before sunrise. What does Boker do? That ox pulling a plow, it opens up, it splits, it divides, it segregates. How does it do that? It does this by revealing the new 24-hour weekly cycle. That's when these, what these letters are in the Boker application. That is dawn. It divides, it splits, and it segregates. And yet people still want to tell me that sunset changes the day. I'm sorry. This is the job that was applied by Yakua to the ox pulling the plow at dawn. Moving on. The second base frequency of the sun, Yaakov 117. Here we read, nor shadow of turning. Yaakov identifies this shadow in the Shene year. That word trope is the Greek word that we get out of or for turning. Trope, it's the identification of the point of return and the point of departure for the celestial identities in the sky. It's a turning, if you will. Number two. The sun frequents the point of Teshuva, being the final cycle of Shanae. This celestial event terminates the previous year. It is the cycle before every Abib season, the final cycle before spring. This is the point of Teshuva. This is what Moshe learned when he was taking his education in Mitzrayim. They governed their, their economy according to the Shanae year and the shadow. And yet we read about this in Genesis 1.14. It's the sign for the Shanae. Teshuvah is a sign. Location, format, and function. Now this is going to be more interesting. I want you to note this purple underline here. It's below the kuf and it's below a vav. It's identified in Ecclesiastes 1.5 as the place of the sun. What does this place look like? What is the track described as in the Hebrew language? When Yahuwah designed this, how did he design it? The sun has been assigned a highly specific dwelling place in the heavens named the Tekufa. It's a circuit. The sun does not deviate from this assignment. Intentionally resulting from this assignment, commissioned by Yahuwah, is the Teshuva shadow sign, and it is specifically designated before Abib as the last cycle of winter. This shadow sign is the catalyst for counting. Psalms 90 verse 12. Teach us to number our days, to bring our hearts unto wisdom. And I need to thank my brother Danan for drilling that into my head. Teach us to number our days. Counting. That's what covenant calendar is all about. Counting. Counting to what? After the shadow sign, the next day at dawn, we begin our count to Abib 14, Passover. Moshe knew this. That's why in Exodus 12, 1-2, Yahuwah said to him, this is the first of your month. It's the beginning of your month to you. How did Moshe do that? Well, he understood about the Tekufa circuit. So what is the descriptive letters all about when it says the place of the sun? What is the description that we're going to get out of 
these Kuf Vav root letters. Considering the Tekufa circuit assignment and the commission of the sun, Psalms 19, 4 and 6, I hope you notice that straight line moving across your, across your screen. We see the descriptive Kuf Vav root, which reveals these definitions. And of course, you see that little face on the corner on the side there. He's marking it out, and I want you to do the same. That face is not there just for something funny to look at. Notice the pen. Mark this out. It's this Kuf Vav definition stretched out in a straight line, stamped out like a plate. That's the definition. Remember, the frequencies emitted proceed in like manner as they are created and released. This is the description of how Yokua created this Takufa circuit. So let's explore the implications of this description. The context is the earth. We see this over here. Here's Aretz. It's earth, land. The Kuf Bav the description is a measuring tape. So in this verse in Isaiah 18.7, you see it over here, and you'll see I've got 18.7 up here, so we know it's accurate. In this verse, we see the Kuf Vav root. And I enlarged it right here so we can see it. Kuf Vav root. Again, Kuf Vav root. Mentioned twice. Do you think it's important? It's mentioned twice, and it comes again for a third time in Mechum, the place of, the place of the sun. So we find the Kuf Vav root three times in this verse. Are we beginning to see the importance? What does this Kuf Vav root mean? Measuring tape, stretched out like a measuring tape, a straight line. Well, that agrees with the straight line, measuring tape. How about a plate? There's an agreement with the plate, three witnesses. Try applying this to a globe, stretched out in a straight line, stamped out like a plate, stretched out like a measuring tape. Does that fit on a globe? Yahuwah's word effectively unravels man's traditions. Here's an interesting picture. I want you to look at this for a minute. Kind of a little difficult eating off of this plate. If you are describing a very important covenant meal, maybe it's a wedding meal. Maybe we're celebrating a wedding would your visual description that you sent, that you texted to your friend, would it appear like this? Is that how you would transfer the knowledge of the meal to your friend? A to keep your steak on a plate like that. And the takufa? What does this have to do? with a takufa. Why is the takufa stamped out like a straight or stamped out like a plate in a straight line, like a measuring tape? Is that making sense? Is that a straight line stamped out like a plate? Is the red circuit a straight line, a measuring tape? Is it stamped out like a plate? Does it also provide coverage until the ends of the earth? Yahuwah said that it covers the ends of the earth. Where's the end? Descriptive perspective number two. We're still having trouble keeping food on that plate stamped out like a plate. Perhaps a double Takufa circuit would cover the ends of the earth. Would this be better? A double Takufa circuit? Well, it would cover the earth better. The problem is we do not find in Scripture anything about a double Takufa circuit. 
There's only one. Here's descriptive perspective from Torah. Notice the food sits on the plate pretty, pretty easily. Stamped out like a plate. Perhaps Yahuwah's single kukufa circuit, this would be the blue line. Perhaps it's better described here, stretched out in a straight line. Stamped out like a plate. Does this fulfill his command quite effectively? <clears throat> if you look at the lines within the blue circle, or oval, I guess, from this perspective, those blue lines represent the, the constellations of the Matsaroth. When you go into the creation account in Genesis 1, this same description is given to the constellations of the Matsaroth. They are stretched out in a straight line. They're straight, stretched out like a measuring tape, stamped out like a plate. <laughs> Would that fit? on a globe? And how do they cover the ends of the earth? Well, here you see that Tukufa circuit is brought down to the ends of the earth. It covers the whole earth at the same time. Might this portray the Kuf Vav root definitions better? Stretched out in a straight line, stamped out like a plate like a measuring tape. There's much more Hebraic definition proof on this. Oh, those Hebrew definitions. They trouble our shoes. <laughs> There's more in the creation account, much more. Something to take note of. As we dig deeper, there could be a lot of questions. Just hang in there. Okay, we're going to move on again with these frequencies. We've looked at some interesting thoughts brought forward by the Kuf Vav root definitions, which pertain to Yahuwah's formation process of the Tekufa circuit. And I hope you notice these frequencies going across your screen. They're intentional. We have noted the Mem prefix, which denotes a constant frequency delivery. Constant. It does not stop. Something like the waves of the ocean. They just keep coming. Also, we mark the second mem, indicating the source for this frequency production. It's a source. This inquiry now transfers to the next word. Again, this is Ecclesiastes 1.5, same verse, and we're looking at this next word, H7602, shuaf, translated to us as gasping. That's a very strange thing. Gasping. The sun is gasping. How do we apply that? How do we understand that? More importantly, how did Abraham apply this? <laughs> what did he know about this as he was sitting under the under the trees of memory, sipping an iced tea in the cool of the day? Is that what he was doing? No. He might have been under the cool of his tent. He might have been in the shade under the trees. But there's a lot more to the Hebrew than what we than what we understand, what we see in English. Anyhow, we're going to continue on. We're looking at this word, shuaf. Again, I want you to look for these, these arrows. All this arrow does is it's telling you that Hebrew reads from right to left. So when you look at a Hebrew word with the Hebrew letters, start on the right-hand side. Sheen. Vav. Aleph, Pe. Note the ox head again. There's that ox, power and authority. Interesting. Let's look at the modern letters, modern Hebrew letters. The top one here is the sheen. To separate, press in with an intensity. When an angry dog bites you, it presses in. With, with intensity. This sheen is known sometimes as teeth. It bites in, it clamps, it makes an imprint, presses in with an intensity. 
the vav. The vav is a nail or a hook upon which items can be connected. And I should have had that connected word emphasized because that's what it does. It makes a connection and it can be for rest. The aleph. Power and authority. It can mean first. And it can mean the provider. Many times attributed directly to Yahuwah and Yahusha. And we come down to the pay. Here's an interesting letter. A pay. It's a mouth. It means there's a message which speaks. There's a reason. This word, Shuaf, has a message for us to understand. It has authority behind it. Authority. Very interesting lexicon definitions next on this word. <clears throat> Here's from the Hebrew lexicon with W.H. Barker. It's from 1776. We're going to be looking at this word gasping or shuaf. So we go down to the root here, and it's shin aleph he. This is the root. Hasteth, yes, that's an old English. It looks like an F, but we understand it as hasteth or draweth in air. Ecclesiastes 1.5. So we know we're on track here. He's speaking directly about this. Pant is more definition here. Pant. Pant, aspire after. Desire, gasp as it were after almost appears a bit negative at this point. Well, let's continue. Continuing on with this quote from W.H. Barker, I want you to look here in the next slide, or the next two slides, we're going to break this quote apart, looking at the Shin Vav root meaning. It's too hard right here to break this down, so I'm going to break it down a little bit easier over here. Same word, same quote, Sheen Vav root meaning. So we have this Sheen and the Vav here coming down to the root. To make level. To make level. Interesting. Didn't we just look at something that was not on level? It had a plate of food being vertical. Why wasn't it horizontal? To make level. Horizontal. To put upon a level. Compare. To be equal, to profit, to be an equivalent, to make an equal, make like, to reckon. Well, there's the authority part of it, to reckon. To lay in an orderly manner as grapes were usually stored, laid out on shelves so that they weren't piled up on top of each other. They were laid out on a flat shelf so they didn't crush each other. To be alike, equal, and sheen vav here, even in equal. One more time. Have you noted the equality theme? Equality. Hold on to this thought. We're looking again here at more. Continuing with the same quote. Here we see the addition of the Aleph, the Aleph letter at the end of the word. It's the same lexicon. Shua. Have you ever heard that word before? Shua? The contrary in the sense to the above. Vanity. A vain thing. A lie. In vain. A vain idol. A false god. What happened to equality? How come there's an opposite, opposite thoughts here? Why? Well, this is very common in Hebrew. This brings us back to context. We must understand context. So we now need to ask ourselves, is this Tekufa circuit vanity and vain? Are we studying about something that is useless? Does it contain a false message? Let's look at some more definitions. I want you to note this word, shuaf, again. And I want you to note this spelling down here. It has an ayan at the end. An ayan. Just something to pay attention to. 
But let's cruise on here. Shua here. Vanity. A vain thing. Falsehood. A lie. In vain. To no purpose. A vain idol. A vain false god. So why are we studying about a Tukufa circuit if it's vanity? Or maybe we're missing something. It seems quite clear the definitions of Shin Vav Aleph are not getting any better. Is the Tukufa circuit, is that vanity? Shoo off. Comparison here. Looking at the ancient Hebrew understanding, the Shin, here's the Here's the ancient Sheen Hebrew. The Sheen letter is understood as resembling a set of teeth which press in with intensity. This causes a separation action and a distinguishing focus placed upon the two separated identities. The Sheen separation is connected. We see this in the Vav. Here's the ancient Vav. It's connected on the hook or in a nail, connected to the Aleph. There's the power and authority, the almighty provider. And it conveys a message which speaks. There we see that letter pay. It has a message which speaks. So what is it? Is it worth studying? Or is it vanity? Now for the questions. Number one. What could possibly be connected with the sun being in a hurry within its tukufa or circuit to its intense focus on gasping to achieve life? And what on this earth, notice the pay and that straight line going across to your screen and the reference to Yaakov 117 and that shadow. What on this earth, whoops, too fast. What on this earth could connect this hurry scenario, causing Abraham to be found by Yahuwah sitting in the door of his dwelling place under the protective covering of the oaks of Mamre? That is the question that we're going to see clear in part two. But for now, we have to continue our research. Would it be prudent to look closer at Tukuf, the letters that form Tukufa, before proceeding further? Remember that equality thought that I said to keep under your hat. Let's look here. Here's the letters. Tav, Kuf, Pe, Tukuf. What is it definition of them? To overpower, overbear, overcome. Come down here to Kuf, power and authority. Well, that's a little bit different than what we were reading earlier. When the description of Shuaf, hmm, how do we apply this? Power and authority. Now we come down to this blue box. Look at these letters. Kav, Kuf, Vav, Pe, He, to Kufa. Imagine that, to Kufa. It's plural. Masculine, tikufon. Strong and mighty are the definitions. Strong and mighty, power and authority. Might this be getting closer to a better understanding? Looking closer at tikuf, the root, power and authority. If we go to Esther, Esther 10 verse 2, we see tikuf with a vav on the end, tekufu. And it's translated as might of him. Might, well, that goes with power and authority. Daniel 2.40, tekufa, mighty. How about these descriptive words? Smash and pulverize are used. Smash and pulverize. That would emphasize mighty, power and authority. We come down here to Esther 9, verse 29, and the letters for Tekuf. On the left, might. One more time. Might. 
we have seen the examples with the context showing the tav kuf he, that root word being emphasized as mighty and powerful. How can this word, shuaf, be linked as descriptive information when delivering vain, vanity, false, and an idol? Is there perhaps something more in context that we're missing? Shall we dig deeper into this astonishing word? Is there something we have not seen yet? Gasping, back to this word, shuaf. I want you to notice the interesting revelations that Job has on H7602 for Job 5. Now, all these verses below here are the same verse. I just want you to show the description in connection with this word shuaf, a robber. This is from the interlinear. Thirsty and pant. Remember we read that pant the definition? thirsty, a desire, a need, a necessity. This is from the English Standard Version. And we look at the Peshitta. Thirsty and devour. Ooh, devour is a pretty strong word. That comes from Shuaf. And the KGV gives us a robber. Swalloweth up. A robber. A robber is not known to take things pleasantly. I have experience with that. Just few days ago, a robber takes what he wants at will. Shoe off. How does this apply? Job has more to declare with H7602 in Job 7 and Job 36. So we're going to look at Brenton's English Septuagint. Shoe off. Grasp. A shadow. Grasp. That's close to gasping grasp. You grab onto something. You hang on to it. There's a need and a purpose. When a servant is laboring diligently on a tedious work, can it be that he or she very eagerly seeks shade from the hot sun? Let's look at Job 36, verse 20. Don't long for night when people vanish in their place. Be careful what your heart has a quest for. It might well serve you harm. That's the word, shuaf. H7602, shuaf supplies us with the understanding of an existence in an intense desire from within. Intense. Not just subtle. Intense. A need, a necessity. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens back to the place where it arose, that it may from thence it may raise. You know, I read this all wrong. Let's let me start on this again. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rose, that it may from thence. Sorry, I keep adding that may. That it, <laughs> no, the, where it rose, that from thence. Thence it may rise again. My brain's playing tricks on me. But from thence it may rise again. The exact place where it departs, it leaves. It's a point of departure. Very, very important. This is a complete circuit according to the will of Yahuwah. So, what is it about this description? An intense desire a need and or a necessity of the sun to accomplish a completed Tukufa circuit. What is it that pertains to this pinnacle point of termination that enables a new beginning? And most importantly, who declared it so and when? Exodus 12.2, Yahuwah speaking to Moshe, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first for you of the months of the year. So how did Moshe understand? How come it doesn't say anything about the sliver of the moon or any other phase of the moon? Moshe just said, or sorry, Yahuwah just said, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first for you of the months of the year. Might it have something to do with Moshe 
Acts 7, verse 22, trained in the wisdom of Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim operated on the Shanae year. Yes, they worshipped the moon too, but their economy was based on the shadow. The pyramids and the sphinx determined the year by the shadow, the day of equinox. Was Yahuwah introducing a new concept to Moshe that he knew nothing about? For what reason had Moshe preserved, sorry, for what reason had Yahuwah preserved Moshe and educated and trained him as if for a future pharaoh position? Was that a big mistake? Was that an oops by Yahuwah? Or was that a purposeful, meaningful training so that Moshe could bring out the Hebrew nation out of Mitzrayim on a calendar so exact that we have trouble even looking at the surface of it. Moshe was trained in the wisdom of Mitzrayim. Moshe became an expert in knowledge and execution of Yahuwah's Shanae schedule based upon the shadow of the Teshuvah. The Teshuvah describes the action of the two specific cycles of the year upon which the turning, that's Teshuvah, the turning of the celestial bodies reveals a degree of light within the straight line shadow. James 1.17 Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no change nor shadow of turning. Why is this verse so incredibly important? Well, if you study deeply, you will understand that Yaakov, or James, as we read in English, the half-brother of Yahusha, prior to the crucifixion, him and his family were on the lunar-based calendar. Yet here, after the crucifixion, Yaakov identifies the shadow that determines the year that can only be judged with a Shanae 300 or 360 degree calendar for the worship calendar, and then the five days added after it. Yaakov is identifying this shadow to shadow type year, the one without intercalation. That means that Yaakov determined there is no change from Genesis 1 1. No change. Yahuwah does not change. It never stopped. That 360 degree worship calendar never changed, even though at 700 BC, there was five days added onto the year at the change of the shadow when the shadow moved back 10 degrees. That 360 degree worship calendar never changed and functions today exactly as it did years ago. And we will be going back to a 360 degree year sorry, 360-day year, so that the three prophetic timelines in Revelation can be accomplished and fulfilled. And here, James is identifying that exact calendar. How? By the shadow of turning that identifies the day of Teshuvah, that identifies the circuit, the Tekufa circuit. So going back to Moshe, in Exodus 12, 2, this month shall be for you the beginning of month. Yahuwah is identifying the vernal equinox or the spring teshuva, the point of the where the shadow comes in the springtime. He's identifying that as the beginning of the year. It shall be the first for you of the months of the year. That's the spring equinox, as we understand it in English terms. Yahuwah recertified the authority of the Teshuvah shadow, the straight line, which determines the end of the previous year. The Teshuvah letters are Tav, Shin, Vav, He, seen below, spelled in correct Hebrew order from right to left. Notice the arrow, right to left. Tav, Shin, Vav, He. And of course, here's the paleo, 
Tav, Shin, Vav, He, right to left. Teshuva is a verb. And when applied to Shane, or year in English, it denotes a point of turning, two specific points. We understand them as equal equinox. One equinox of superior authority, and that was designated superior by Yahuwah himself. This month shall be for you the beginning of months, the vernal equinox. There are two of these peculiar events within one Shonei year, the later one in September, as we understand in Gregorian terms. Yahuwah chose one Teshuvah, that's the shadow at equinox, as the catalyst event to begin the year. Are we paying attention? Again, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. So why is it termed as a catalyst event? By many scriptural examples, the straight shadow line, which occurs on the Teshuvah turning point, immediately prior to prior to the hours before the month of Abib, this shadow finalizes that Shanae. The shadow enables... It announces and enables the new year's first cycle to commence with the ensuing light of dawn. When that shadow happens, next dawn is your first day of the new year. Ecclesiastes 1.5 hurries. Are we starting to see a glimpse of the reason that the sun was hurrying to get back to that point of departure, that shadow. Remember in all this that the Sheen letter shows a division of something, a division. The Shemesh, or the sun, is in a scurry. It's a hurry. There's a reason. There's a necessity that it must get back to that point of departure, there is something that it will do that supplies life. Life is when the Moedim come around, the time of life. So the questions intensify. What reason causes the sun to be recorded under Hebrew definition as in an intense hurry to return back to the place where it arose? Where is that place. Why is it recorded the sun is under such a purposeful commission to the extremity of gasping as if for air or life? Hurries. The sun is in a hurry. The lesser 24-hour scurry. Yahuwah's mercy reneweth every dawn. And I say hallelujah to that. 365 times plus a daily 24-hour cycle, seven times every week, 52 weeks every shane. That's one of the hurries of the sun. Lam L Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. It is of Yahuwah's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Every morning, that's Boker. That's the ox pulling the plow. The division, one more time, the division. So the sun hurries. It's in a scurry, if you will. Why is it recorded? The sun is under such an emphasized purposed commission to the extremity of gasping as if for life itself. And if it were for life, what life would it support? What is detailed Hebraically about the place where it arose, that its commission would be considered important, equal to oxygen? Equal to oxygen? How can this be? Where have we seen even the slightest indication of oxygen? 
Let's revisit a slide, shall we? It is a Hebraic description of the Tekufa, the circuit of the sun. Yahuwah has declared that this circuit has a starting and ending point. Why is that? Again, shoo off. This is a second viewing of the same slide. Just want to make sure we are understanding here. Ecclesiastes 1.5. The sun shoo off. It hasteth and it draweth in air. Draweth in air. It pants for air. It pants. It aspires after. It desires it. Gasps as it were after. What elemental necessity causes a body to draweth in air? To aspire after? Could it be oxygen? That which supports life? Yes, physically, oxygen supports life. But what are we talking about on a spiritual level here? What type of oxygen is it gasping for? The sun is in a hurry. For what? Normally, we hear of teshuva in context of relationship with Yahushua HaMashiach. Sinners may stop their futile life in this world. They can turn 180 degrees, that means drop their habits, their contamination, and they can turn and begin a purposeful life with Yahusha. That is called Teshuvah. They've turned 180 degrees into a different life. They have intentionally changed the mode of operation in their lives and have chosen a purposeful option, Teshuvah. The flux in their life has stopped, and another separate identity has begun. I say hallelujah for that. However, we're looking for the context of specific time. So let's get scriptural. Teshuvah's intentional purpose. Teshuva in scripture. Let's have a look. Second Samuel 11 verse 1. And it came to be at when? At the turn of the year. That word is teshuva in Hebrew. At the time sovereigns go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Yisrael, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. That was not good for David, but that's for another study. First Kings 20, verse 22. And the prophet came to the sovereign of Yisrael and said to him, Go, strengthen yourself, and know and see what you should do. For at the turn of the year, Teshuvah, the sovereign of Aram, is coming up against you. 1 Kings 20, verse 26. And it came to be at the turn of the year, Teshuvah, that Ben-Hadad mustered the Arameans and went up to Afek to fight against Yisrael. Teshuvah's intentional purpose, number two. First Chronicles 20, verse 1. And it came to be at the turn of the year, Teshuvah, at the time sovereigns go out to battle, that Joab led out the power of the army and destroyed the land of the children of Ammon, and came and besieged Rabbah. You know the rest? Armies do not go out to war before winter. It's an extremely poor idea. Armies go out to war at the time when they can live out in the fields and in the woods and in the mountains in the springtime. At the turn of the year, Teshuvah, the equinox, the turn of the year, that's when the shadow tells them it's the turn of the year. That's when the springtime arrives, the shadow time. Second Chronicles 36, verse 10. And at the Teshuva, sovereign Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babel with the valuable utensils from the house of Yahuwah. And he made Sidkiyahu, or Zedekiah, Yehoiakim's brother, sovereign over Yehuda and Jerusalem. There it is again, Teshuva, the turn of the year. Teshuva up close. And I want you to go to the top right hand of your screen here. 
And you'll see the Hebrew letters, Teshuva, to the return of the year. There's that word Shanae, a direct connection, Teshuva and Shanae. You do not have a Teshuva in the lunar calendar. Second Chronicles 36 10. This is from the Interlinear Scripture Analyzer. Please notice that in each of these verses, the word Shane is present. This is a direct connection to Genesis 1.14, the fourth cycle of creation, a sign. Shane indicates through the Hebrew definition that this type of year must be of a duplication. It must be a seed within a seed according to its own kind, identity. This means the year identity must be a perfect match from the year previous to it. It cannot be of a different length. It cannot be of a different determination factor. It must be according to the shadow, a perfect duplication. There must be a governing cutoff point, a regular one that does not fluctuate and it must have the authority to reproduce the 360 cycle worship year in sequentially exact segments. This sequence began at Genesis 1-1, the very first cycle of creation, and it continues today. When you look at Genesis 1-1, you can realize there, through the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, or Lefbet, and the 7,000 years generated for this earth. When you divide 22 into 7, you come out with the mathematical equation 3.14. What's interesting about that? It does not stop. It is, a, it is an eternal equation. Think about this. This sequence, this tukufa, with the Teshuva shadow is integral in that covenant. Didn't we talk about covenant at the beginning of the study? This is the covenant that was designed, organized, and established by Yahuwah in verse 1 of your scripture. An eternal sequence that never ends, that never changes. Yaakov recognized that. A sequence that does not stop. Interestingly, any lunar type year, any Dead Sea Scroll affiliate, or any other calendar whatsoever that incorporates intercalation of, a, of any kind at any time cannot fulfill Shane, starting from Genesis 1.1. Need to think about that very carefully. Teshuva, the cutoff catalyst. The Teshuva, or turning point of the celestial identities, provides a straight line shadow, James 1.17, and that determines the final cycle of a Shane. The very next dawn is the first cycle of the new year that is proven solidly from Scripture. From this new year cycle, being number one, the count to Abib 14, Passover, begins. The Moedim count starts with strict accordance to the event occurrence of the Teshuvah shadow. This specific Teshuvah shadow is only produced by the commission of the sun, being commanded to return, scurry, to its designated starting point within the Matzeroth. A scurry, it returns with a purpose. This commission is accomplished within Yahuwah's peripheries of the Tekufa circuit, as outlined in Ecclesiastes 1.5, and as spoken very well into in Psalms 19. Question. What is the base importance of the Moedim? Could it be life? Why is the sun described as gasping for air, or life, to get back to the finish point of its circuit? 
is teshuva that which provides life? The teshuva, the turning point of the celestial identities, provides a straight line shadow. Is it possible that Yahuwah allotted this shadow phenomena as a sign? Genesis 1.14 Emanating from the two great lights recorded on cycle number four of creation week? And what are the entities that formulate this sign? Number one, there must be a sun, a Shemesh. Number two, there must be light coming from the Shemesh. Number three, there must be a Matzeroth to have this circuit, which the sun was established and designated within that circuit. And number four, there must be a vantage point from the earth to observe this shadow, the light that form or the shadow that is formed on the ground when you have a stake in the ground. That's the sign that, start, that ends the year and initiates the count to Passover. Without even one of these identities, the cyclical way, the Moedim of life, would not exist. The Matzeroth ident identifies the timing location. The sun conducts the correct action across the heavens. The sunlight dictates the appropriate sign and or signal. And the earth receives this covenant, marked as a shadow degree of light. But if we are not observing it, what good does it do us? If we're not staking out the shadow and observing that straight line, it does us no good whatsoever. We need to stake out that shadow. You have removed the key to understanding. We read that in Luke eleven fifty two. What is that key? And who removed it? When a purposeful disregard for even one of these identities occurs, the cyclical way, the moedim of life, will cease to be understood on this earth. The moedim is the way of life. The moedim is determined in timing. Teach us to number our days to a Passover, Abib 14. If we're not on Abib 14, on Yahuwah's schedule, where are we? The Matzeroth identifies and establishes the timing location prophetic markers, past, present, and future. The sun conducts the correct defining action, delineating a straight line path across the heavens two times a year. The sunlight dictates the appropriate sign and signal by forming a shadow via a staff in the ground. This staff enables the shadow, which is to be marked and determined by man. Do you have the ability to push a stick in the ground? If not, I'm sure you have a friend that would do that for you. A staff. Recall the serpent staffs? of Egypt, they were destroyed. The earth receives this covenant in marked form as a shadow. The degree of light commissioned by Yahuwah in Genesis 1, 14 to 18. The accumulative ingredient, that's you. What are you doing? Are you going to mark out your shadow? Or are you going to let somebody else do it? Are you going to let NASA declare the shadow when their timing is not accurate? What about you? You are the accumulative ingredient. It is your part. Are you willing to mark out the shadow? Or will you pass that off? Moving forward here. Note, the moon has no part of this commissioned spiritual formulation, which articulates the worship Moedim within Yahuwah's Shane, the duplicating year. Nor is there any mention of the moon in creation week. Appointment accuracy, timing, is paramount. Now, be certain 
We are not removing the moon. We're not removing any authority of it whatsoever. The moon has its own ordinances of which it provides life for agricultural purposes. Without the moon, we would be dead. It's that simple. But Yahuwah did not appoint the moon to determine the feasts of Yahuwah. It has its own ordinances. The sun, in Ecclesiastes 1.5, is recorded in English as hurrying back to the place where it arose. The Hebrew definitions describe an intensity as deep as gasping for air. When one swims underwater for a time and returns to the surface, there is one necessity. Your lungs are crying for air. A top priority at that moment is to draw in air, namely oxygen, for survival, for life. So what is it that the sun's course of action to Kufa is intensely preserving? Is it encompassed within the covenant? Could it be the count which the sun is bent on preserving? Is that the reason the sun hurries back to the place where it arose? So that it could provide a starting point for the count? Psalms 90 verse 12. Teach us to number our days to bring our hearts unto wisdom. What happens if the shadow is discarded? What happens if the equinox in English terms is set aside? What happens if we are given a different way of determining the worship calendar of Yahuwah, and we do not have a proper count. What happens if our count is on a different calendar? What happens if we look to the sliver moon and we don't even have a count? Whose calendar are we on then? And where does our allegiance go then without the count? Is it important? Does the sun realize the necessity to get back to this place where it arose so that we can be on Yahuwah's count? The Teshuvah shadow sign, as mentioned, signals the impending time to begin the count to Abib 14, Passover, at the next light of dawn. Passover first involved death. Passover was timed in a type format by the shadow of Teshuvah. Passover was fulfilled in the antitype according to the shadow of Teshuvah. Yahushua exclaimed, It has been accomplished. The Teshuvah also timed that wave sheaf presentation of first fruit by Yahushua's Hamashiach after the resurrection. I need to pull that apostrophe and S out of there. I'll read that again. The wave sheaf presentation of first fruit by Yahushua HaMashiach after his resurrection, when he said, it has been accomplished. That was a prophetic statement. That also involved his first fruit presentation at dawn on the first day after the seventh day Sabbath. What about this shadow of Teshuva? It was timed by that first fruit presentation, the etzem, the bone structure of your salvation, that was based on the shadow of the teshuva providing a count on his schedule. Let's review the way. So what identity, what identity, let me get rid of these floating controls. What identity is the sun? Sorry, within what identity is the sun in a hurry? Psalms 19.4. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he put up a tent for the sun. Their line, that's the Matzeroth. And their words. That's the constellations that tell us the story of the plan of salvation within the Matzeroth. In them, he put up a tent for the sun. That sun tra trans transverses the, con the constellations every year in the Matzeroth. It does not remove itself from the Matzeroth. 
Is the sun persistently hurrying for a tekufa? No. The sun is already functioning within its tekufa circuit. It is seeking something within that circuit. There exists a special identity that the sun fully and intentionally determines to achieve within that very tekufa circuit. What is it? I'm sure you've heard me say it numerous times throughout this study, but we need to concentrate on this. It speaks without a voice, Psalms 19.3. Their line. Whose line? The context is the Matzeroth. The message which speaks by pictures is encased within the Matzeroth, the constellations, and covers the whole earth. Their line is Yahuwah's designated pathway or track upon which they frequent to guide humans to accept Yahusha. There's your frequency. One more time. Psalms 19.4 declares the sun has been designated a dwelling place, an ahel, or a tabernacle, or a tent. It is within the Matzeroth's domain to which the sun has been commanded to inhabit. That highly specified habitation is deemed by Yahuwah as the Tekufa circuit within the Matzeroth. The Teshuvah shadow stops the count. It stops the circuit. The Tekufa count restarts the next dawn. That count brings us to Abib 14 which starts the time of life. The Teshuvah shadow sign, as mentioned, signals the impending time to begin the count to Abib 14, or Passover. When? At the next light of dawn. Passover first involved death. With death came life, Yahushua's resurrection. There is much more to this life concept. Let's consider the way. Genesis 3.24 And he drove the human out. He made him tabernacle at the east of the Garden of Eden. And he set the cherubim and the flaming revolving sword to guard the way to the tree of life. Shamar, to guard, protect, preserve integrity. What was he protecting? The way, if you look over here on the interlinear I provided here, the way, Derek, this is the this is the time of life. This is the feasts of Yahuwah in context, of course. And here is the word Shamar. It's given to us as guard. Guard the way. Are you guarding the way? How do you do that? Well, one of the ways is to guard the understanding of the shadow. And how do you do that? Mark it. Get out, put your stick in the ground, and mark the shadow. Guard the way. In Ecclesiastes 1.5, the sun is recorded in English as hurrying back to the place where it arose. The Hebrew definitions describe an intensity as deep as gasping for air. As mentioned in swimming, Upon your return to the surface, there is one necessity. Your lungs are crying for air. The top priority at the time is to draw in air, namely oxygen, for survival, for life. Keep this thought. Genesis 3.24. If we look at Genesis 3.24, you will see there's the Aleph Tav. That's authority and covenant. Could that be Yahushua HaMashiach? Connected to the way. This is the cyclical feasts of Yahuwah. In context, of course. The Derek, the way. Connected to the Aleph Tav, Yahushua HaMashiach. Note, the Aleph Tav is seen before 1870 Derek. They have a direct connection. The Aleph Tav, the beginning and the ending, being linked directly to the tree of lives, plural, was and is being guarded by Yahuwah. This Kodesh pathway to the tree of life 
is termed in Hebrew as Derek, the way in under in English. In the in the fuchsia box on the left, notice lives. It's not just the tree of life, tree of lives, plural. I'm so thankful for that one. Remember this term, tree of lives, as we will return to this shortly. So what is the way, the Derek? Looking at the paleo letters, we see from the right, a dalit, a resh, and a kaf. Remember, Yahusha said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 10, verse 9. Dalit is a door. A door? A portal. To where? Eternal life, maybe? Resh is the head. It's the top identity in charge of the universe. Could that be Yahusha? Kaf is the palm of the hand. The palm maintains a grip on circumstance. What is this, the way system, that has the ability to usher humans into the kingdom of Yahuwah? Might we see the basic entry application format in Leviticus 23? How about this? We look at Parkhurst from 1762. We're going to look at the way, if you see the letters up here, to come. Or so, so, to go, come, or put forwards, to proceed, to stretch out, or forth, to cause to go, or proceed. Down here, a way, path, or road, a way, or journey, a way, custom, or manner. Now we come to the red box. It frequently refers to the way in which men should go the manner in which they should act according to the revealed will of Yahuwah. The revealed will of Yahuwah. And it lists a bunch of verses. We're going to be looking at some of them. Come down to the bottom. Yehovah possessed me in the beginning of his way, i.e. his work of creation at the very beginning. So let's read some of these scriptures that it mentioned there. The context is the Moedim. Exodus 32, verse 8. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. Wasn't the covenant just commanded to them in Mount Sinai and they agreed to it? Didn't they just turn away from the way, the feasts? They have made themselves a molded calf and have bowed themselves to it and slaughtered to it and said, this is your mighty one, O Yisrael, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, a counterfeit feast, a false timing. On the 99th day, count to the Omer. Deuteronomy 9.12 Then Yahuwah said to me, Arise, go down quickly from here, for your people, whom you brought out of Mitzrayim, have acted corruptly. They have quickly turned aside from what? The way, the derrick, which I commanded them. Image. It was a feast. It was a counterfeit system for worship that is still observed today. When people observe the 90 day, 99 day count to the Omer and have Pentecost at the 99 day count, they are celebrating the golden calf. Again, continuing with the way, let's look at Deuteronomy 32, 4. The rock, we know who that is. The rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are right ruling, an L of truth, and without unrighteousness. Righteous and straight is he. Deuteronomy 11.28 And the curse, if you do not obey the commands of Yahuwah, your Elohim, but turn aside from the way, Derek, which I command you today, to go after other mighty ones, which you have not known. 2 Samuel 22.31 The L, 
his derek, his way is perfect. The word of Yahuwah is proven. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. There's a promise we need to remember. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Proverbs 8.22 Yahuwah possessed me at the beginning of his derrick, his way, as the first of his works of old. So we're looking at a spiritual microscope into the physical here. Again, Deuteronomy 11.28 And the curse, uh uh-oh, there's a curse if you do not obey the commands of Yahuwah, your Elohim. There's a curse if you turn aside from the way. There's a curse if you go after other mighty ones. There's a curse if you reject Yahuwah's Teshuvah shadow method of determining time as commissioned in Genesis 1 and persistently gravitate to the lunar system as distinctly recorded in Isaiah 1 which syncretizes paganism with and into Yahuwah's Kodesh format for life, his Derek. There's a curse if you choose to determine time, that would be feasts, by Jericho's defunct lunar system, even though the lunar worship foundation walls were driven into the ground on the 13th trump of a, of a silver shofar, a 13th trump. And yet, that is so prevalent today. People do not understand the foundation of lunar worship was destroyed at Jericho by the trump, the 13th trump of a silver shofar. There's a curse if you reject Yahuwah's Teshuvah shadow. That is the eternal high 3.14 3.14 of Genesis 1.1, that duplicating seed within a seed found in verses 11 and, two, 11 and 12 of chapter 1, that pi duplicates into eternity, and yet people still reject it today. Again, number two, today there's a curse if we turn aside from the way. There's a curse if you reject the repeated efforts of Yahuwah to extract Yisrael today from worshiping other gods, Baal, the sun god, and Ashtoreth, and the moon god. There's a curse if you reject Revelation 12.1, Bethula, the bride of Yahusha, standing above, not on the moon, in a symbol of absolute victory over the lunar system, of determining counterfeit feasts of the Yahudim. Of the Yahudim. See John 7, verse 2, 6, 7, and 19. Of the Yahudim. John is telling you something. Are you listening? If there's a curse, if you reject Solomon building the lava, the sea, founded upon 12 bakar. Remember that word, bakar? The root of Boker, morning at dawn. This is the 12 feet under the lava, the 12 bakar, the oxen hoofs, complementing and leading into Bethula's 12 stars, that's the months, on her Shanae crown, indicating a Shanae year, which has never changed, Malachi 3 6, since its inception at Genesis 1. 11 to 5. Solomon knew this. He knew that the 12 months, the original program as Yahuwah had it, he knew that that continued without changing. He wasn't changing it. If he'd wanted to change it, he might have put 13 oxen hoofs under that lava, but he did not. Yahuwah does not change. That system continues today as it did from the opening verse of Genesis 1. Part 3. Out of covenant. If we turn aside from the way, we are out of covenant. There is a curse if we reject Solomon's 12 bakar, the laver with the oxen hoof foundation, which exudes authority through the ox, 
of which boker, dawn, is a derivative of the root word bakar. The 12, not 13, laver feet indicate a bringing forth of light, a dawning 12 times per year. The laver represents a gathering point, the sea of people. That's what the laver is all about. A gathering, it's the sea for which the Melchizedek priests of Yahuwah are to cleanse themselves of contamination. Cleanse yourselves from the abomination of the lunar 13th month system, Jericho, and strive to attain status only achieved through the Ruach HaKodesh in order to sit at the feet of Yahushua HaMashiach as one of the bride on that great day. Isaiah 116, cleanse yourselves, stop doing evil. That's what's written. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. The laver's 12 oxen feet, 1 Kings 7, 44, and one sea, and the 12 oxen, there's that word, bakar, and the 12 oxen under the sea. In the ancient Hebrew, Aleph Tav, Yahuwah is represented as the Aleph, the ox. The Aleph, the source of light, spiritual first, physical second, equals life. This word, Beit Kuf Resh, Oker, is also the word for dawn, light. The Bukhar feet of the laver, when used to cleanse pagan contamination, lunar Jericho, deceit from one's life, light of the sun, Yehusham Shiach, is dawn, brought forth, bursting out as the eyelashes of dawn, into the person who has chosen to become a new Melchizedek priest. Eyelashes of dawn. When it's dark out and those first streams of light are bursting forth, can you see the eyelashes of dawn as written in Job 3, verse 9? Eyelashes of dawn. That's when the Shabbat starts. The lover's 12 oxen, sandal, foundation. Could it be those feet are sandals? Could it be that Yahusha's sandals replicated and duplicated this system of worship? The eyelashes of dawn. Yahusha's testament, not just his spoken voice, but his sandals speak. A double portion by his sandals speaking. Genesis 32, 24. And Yaakov was left alone, and a man wrestled with him. Until the breaking of the day, there's his sandals, his double portion, eyelashes of dawn, Job 3, 9. Here's the double portion, Genesis 32, 26. And he, we know that was Yahusha, he said, let me go for the day breaks. He told us when the day breaks. Why is it that we have believed for so long that we're told, when we're told that the Shabbat starts at sunset? Yehusha told us, he spoke it, and his sandals walked it out. Could that be a triple portion? Let me go, for the day breaks. Okay, back from a bit of a bunny trail. Let's scamper back to what is the way that the bakar, the oxen laver feet, beckon us to restore. What is that way? Going back to the Hebrew lexicon here, looking at the word derek, it's a continuation of this. Derek, to go along, walk, or tread, on which the sole of your feet shall tread. Coming down here, to go or tread upon as grapes or olives, and so press out their juices. Hmm. 
Derek. That's an interesting one. Press out their juices. Coming down to this, these ones down here. Juice of grapes was expressed for wine. A man with feet and legs bare, treading the fruit in a kind of cistern. Derek, that's an interesting one. As we view the different contexts in how this word Derek is used in the scriptures, it becomes very apparent that Derek can be used to directly reference the Melchizedek Covenant, which contains the cyclical Moedim of Yahuwah. Cyclical in that they return to the starting point. There's that starting point. Ecclesiastes 1.5. It returns there each Shane every year. Genesis 1.14. There's that sign. And start over once again to repeat that's seed within a seed, Genesis 1, 11 and 12. What does it repeat? The plan of salvation, encapsulated within the festal pattern methodology of Yahuwah. So what about these grapes? Should we, Derek, tread and crush out the juice of life from the Torah? Isn't crushing the grapes a form of dissecting? to reveal and harvest that which is on the inside? What substance is filling your cistern? As per specific context, Derek can be observed as directly referencing the cyclical festal schedule, which revolves and returns every year. How does this relate to the sun being in a hurry to return back to its starting point. Let's quickly step out of the line and examine Proverbs 8.22 in another light. Well, bear with me. We haven't got many left. Proverbs 8.22. Could it be the way existed before creation of this earth? Yahuwah himself acquired me as the beginning of his way preceding his deeds of yore. Derek, proceed beginning of his way. Leviticus 23.2 Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, The feasts of Yahuwah, which ye shall call holy convocation, even these are my feasts. Derek, not just feasts, but a lifestyle. A lifestyle. We're going to be looking in part two about a lifestyle. Proverbs 8.22, read that whole verse. Yahuwah possessed me, the beginning of his way, as the first of his works of old. If the system of Pestal Moedim and the Melchizedek order existed prior to the creation of this earth, is it possible this system, by design, was incorporated as the seed, Genesis 1, 11, and 2, this seed being planted onto this earth, the intentional DNA of salvation. Do we recall the instruction to Moshe on earth as it is in heaven? Do you think this system of the Moedim and the Melchizedek order, do you think it would need to follow that pattern? That was instructed. Yahuwah is all about patterns. Would he break the pattern? He told Moshe, on earth as it is in heaven. So where did this festal Moedim program come from? And the Melchizedek order. Could it be seeded from Zion? How does 1870 Derek provide the pathway to the tree of life? Tree of lives. Look at this picture before you. We're told it's a rock. That's what we're told. But if you look at it and you break it down, you see that there's columns in it. This is a picture of what was once a massive tree, a pillar of strength that could be observed over a great distance. Is it hard to understand that this could be a tree? Well, when you break it down and you see the makeup of this 
and many of these these pieces around the earth that are solidified into rock, you'll understand that there are many, many, many of these ancient trees around the earth. This was a tree at one point. Now we get to Abraham. We're going to be looking at the part two of this study. We laid the foundation for when Abraham was sitting. He had made himself comfortable. He was sitting in the protection of the oak trees, in the heat of the afternoon. What if Adam was, see, or sorry, what if Abraham was sitting around a tree, an oak tree that looks something like this? A massive, massive tree. We see in the verse here, Genesis 18, 1, in Hebrew, Ishma. This is where we get the word sitting. We're going to be looking very, very closely at this word. Where was he sitting? He was sitting by Alni, the Alni being the trees, the oaks. Where? Mamre. Did you notice it has two mems here? And a resh and an aleph? There's some pretty serious information coming in part two. Was Abraham sipping an iced tea in the door of his tent? Well, he might have been sitting in the door of his tent. He might have been comfortable. He might have been enjoying the shade. Yeah. Physically, yeah. But what about this spiritual aspect of Abraham? We have laid the foundation for the shadow determining the count. What about Abraham? How far does one move when seated? Where was Abraham? What was his lifestyle? Was Abraham treated in, sorry, was Abraham seated in the way? Or was he simply in the door of his tent? Part two, we'll be examining these Hebrew words. Did Abraham pay attention to the scurry of the Shemesh? We shall see. This is the end. It's been a good one today. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions or comments about this teaching, please contact us at questions at studythecalendar.com at Covenant Calendar Classroom. I know your time is valuable, and I thank you for sharing your time with me. May Yahuwah bless you. Thank you. Shalom.